Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Roth Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for the 22nd Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on November 1st, 2020, are Micah chapter 3, verses 5 through 12. The semi continuous Old Testament reading is Joshua 3, 7 through 17. Psalm 43. We are in our third reading from 1 Thessalonians, chapter 2, 9 through 13, and then Matthew 23, 1 through 12. And if you are looking for a podcast for all saints, if that is a day that you celebrate in your tradition, there is a separate podcast for the All Saints Sunday text, but this is the 22nd Sunday after Pentecost. And uh, Rolf, welcome back. We missed you those those first. So I just sing by myself. It was very sad. I apologize. So do you want to sing? It's you want to sing anything back. right now? Anything? Uh, no, um, not yet. Not yet. Okay. I can't well, think of you, what song goes with Micah 3. Yeah. Well, if you have a, you know, a couple more sips of coffee and you think of uh, a song that just comes to your mind for Micah uh, 3. I'll be ready to go. Just, all right, I'm with you. All right, good. Uh, so we're back, uh, back in uh, Matthew. Uh, well, we're still in Matthew, coming uh, toward the uh, toward the end here of our year of Matthew. Um, Matthew 23, one through 12. And uh, you know, the the first thing that I I thought about um, in this passage was, and you know, and in particular as we. Uh, at least in the United States, uh, are looking in two days to uh, to our presidential election. Uh, the ways in which we think about uh, or navigate or adjudicate authenticity uh, and 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 sort of that that correlation to the integrity uh, between, um, between, uh, power or powerful positions and, but then how does that, um, how does it then manifest in, in what you do and what you say and what you teach? Uh, and, uh, that, you know, that's part of, I mean, there's a lot of other things going on here, but part of what's I think happening here, I, I just immediately thought of what is authentic teaching or what is authentic authenticity when it comes to, uh, when it comes to thinking about um, uh, having a having a place of of power or having a place of authority, um, so I'm not sure what I, what to do with that. But I but it just just this calling to uh, a, a kind of um, authenticity in living or an authenticity in you know even going back to the Beatitudes, authenticity in uh, in in do our do our do our deeds match our do our deeds match our beliefs? Do our actions really line up with who we think God is? And so that's that's one direction I had thought of. Others? I had a similar uh, look at that in terms of uh, how much of uh, this idea of saying one thing that is quote unquote the right thing, but undermining that. Um, because our actions truly speak louder than our words. And so people see the hypocrisy. And, and so I just thought of um, how, um, it, how ironic it was for me that uh, in, in many ways, Jesus is describing what we live out today as a, st a staged reality TV. You know, so we forget that reality TV is staged. Um, the reason that it is so captivating or compelling is because they clip and capture the things that are, are going to be the most compelling for us to attend to. And um, sometimes we can do that and maybe, you know, uh, we are recognizing that because all of our churches that have not been able to meet in person don't have the resources for this fancy kind of uh, of uh, filming and videoing and, and, and voiceovers and, and, and clips and things like that. And yet the authenticity of what it means to be a part of the community is uh, whether or not people are hearing about the presence of God and are feeling that they belong to this community. 
And so everyone that has lifted themselves up as the performer, or I'm sorry, the text says as the teacher, um, everyone that has lifted themselves up may not be the person whose actions we should be following. And uh, I, I just found that to be a compelling text for us to hear in this mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. I wonder if uh, Ufi might even widen the circle a little bit beyond just authentic teaching to authentic discipleship. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously here Jesus is targeting specific people, um, specific leaders. It's not the first time um, that he's done so in this gospel. These, you know, the, we're, we're getting very close to his arrest. But we're going, to, we're going to get two parables in the next two weeks that involve people who we thought were insiders being disciplined for having done something wrong. We're also going to encounter three weeks from now, the sheep and the goats, which has its own difficulties, but people seem to like that one more than they like the other, the other two, the talents and the, and the bridesmaids. Sorry, I reversed those in order. But, um, but this is so important to Jesus and has been throughout this gospel in terms of who is authentically following and what does that look like? Um, and what kind of fruit does it bear or what kind of expectation comes with that? And it's, it's just, I think it's so, spending a little bit of time with a text like this, which seems to be a tough text to preach in my view, will pay off for that. But it also forces us to ask, if we're gonna ask what does authentic discipleship look like, we have to ask what are the consequences of inauthentic discipleship or what are the consequences of abusive discipleship? And that's, that's worth talking about in a lot of settings. Wow, absolutely. Or abused discipleship could be the other way, right? Some disciples are abusers. Some mm -hmm. have had their discipleship so messed up by other people. Um, it, might be, it might be a good Sunday to reflect on that a little bit, if, that's, if that rings true in some ways in your context. Well, I think, I think that's a good point in that so much of how... Well, I, I wonder, my, my question is, to what extent uh, how we tend to talk about discipleship ends up being a more individualized affair uh, and, and tending our own, you know, uh, our own lives of discipleship, our own lives of faith. But then where we think about how, how we do live that out has an impact on others, which is, uh, which is not just about, um, it's not just about, it's, I think I want to distinguish, well, I don't know, it, it's, it is like loving your neighbor, I guess, but it's, but it's actually imagining that you are, the, who, who, and who you are in the world and how you are in the world does affect others, and, uh, and, yeah, and so I think that the the way in which we can talk about that in such a way that it's not um, that casts discipleship in a in a kind of light that that pushes it more toward a in a communal activity, uh, I think would I think might be I think might be helpful. Anybody else? Um, I was reminded of a, a, a quote by in the in the uh, Senate hearings and in Supreme Court Senate hearings uh, uh, a little while ago. Uh, Sheldon Whitehouse said, "When you find hypocrisy in the daylight, look for power in the shadows." Mm -hmm. um, and so it's just like just the ways in which you were talking about, you know, joy in terms of of um, that that hypocrisy is so tied to um, sort of preservation of power uh, and and the ways in which those are are related um, and and you certainly see that present that dynamic present in this text um, and, um, it, I don't know I was gonna say and also it, it, if we move to the Micah text it does that all over again in a very powerful way um, and I just made that shift because that hypocrisy is often to preserve power. And, you know, once you've re re reached that celebrity status, um, you know, you really want to keep it. 
And um, in, in so many ways, we've kind of turned our, our congregations or, or our, our leadership uh, in the congregation, our pastor to being the, the, the celebrity on stage. Um, which is why I really appreciated, you know, Matthew's turning it to, uh, Matt turning it to discipleship. Um, and in, in the gospel here, Jesus is saying, don't call yourself the instructor. Um, so it's a turning to, we are to be the disciples. But when we make this turn to Micah, wow, that's a call out. The, the prophets who lead my people astray, they're saying the very thing we want to hear. They're saying everything's okay. They're saying peace. Wow, that's a scary word for us if we want to talk about the difference between authenticity and hypocrisy. And the, the reality is the word seems to be a living word for us today because that's, that's, that's exactly what the text is calling the church to name. Yeah, the Micah text is terrifying, right? I mean, for anybody who teaches or preaches or holds leadership in any way, shape, or form, it's terrifying, <laughs> which is why, of course, we should read it. Yeah, the Micah text, uh, one of the reasons Micah is so interesting as a book it, uh, compared to First Isaiah is they come from the same time, but their social location is different. Isaiah lives in Jerusalem. Uh, he's consulted by the king. He's the prophet to the royal court. And so he is in Jerusalem saying, among other things, while he condemns the sins of the king and the people in Jerusalem, he's, he is saying Jerusalem itself will be preserved. Micah lives in flyover country, square states. And he, so he's out in, literally in the country saying, yeah, um, so you're in the city saying it's going to be fine. We're out here when the Assyrian army's uh, overrunning the country and you're saying it's going to be fine, Isaiah, it's not because uh, we're out here. So, so he's, so he goes on to say, uh, you build Zion with blood and Jerusalem with wrong. Right. And then, so he's the first one who says Zion shall be plowed as a field and Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins. And so, you know, it, it, it works for every center of power versus the flyover country, uh, whether it's Washington and, the, and the, it, either the inner cities or the uh, prairies. It works where we are in Minnesota with, uh, you know, the St. Paul, the, the capital versus, you know, the uh, inner cities or the outstate. It works with the church, with, uh, works with the seminary, you know, as the center of it, it's, it's a real condemnation of people who have um, migrated to the center of power and don't understand the reality that their policies, their leadership is causing for those who fail. Mm. They are failing in their leadership and therefore who's actually being hurt. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. So I, I wonder what this sounds like in a, in a sermon. <laughs> Right now, whether it's this text or Matthew or some kind of combination where you help people look at the what are our sources of religious authority? Like, how do we know when we're right? And, you know, simply we'll read the Bible isn't, isn't enough. I mean, just to invite people into the things. What do we rely on to know that we're in the right lane? Um, you know, obviously tradition, confessions, all these things play a part, but still. Just to, I mean, have people reflect on that and where are our, um, where are the, the places where we haven't looked, where are the, where are the biases that, that influence that? I mean, what are those, what are the guardrails? <laughs> I, I've, I've got to say, I appreciate Ralph putting it in its ancient context and drawing the parallel that continues in the failure of human behavior. Um, and, and I think that's where it becomes such a dangerous text to read because we're just like they were. And so we're, we're indicted by this message at the same time when it's a, a word that we need to hear to say, we've, you know, we want to believe that when someone from the central office says everything is okay, 
Um, we want to believe that because th then that means we're safe. But maybe the word of truth, which, you know, we talked about a couple weeks ago, maybe the word is to pay attention that we aren't safe. It's, it's who you, it's one thing, it's who you listen to, obviously. Are you listening to the prophet who's filled with power, Micah? I am filled with power to declare to Jacob his transgression. Are you listening to the people at the bottom, obviously, who are suffering the most? Um, who are you listening to? I mean, we have this argument quite often at the school where we all teach, which is who are we listening to, to to know whether we're being successful? And we like to listen to people who tell us things that comfort us. We don't like to listen to people that tell us things that discomfort us. I think that's just human nature. Mm -hmm. But I do think, I mean, you asked like, what are the, what are the guardrails, Matt? I, I guess I, I, I think one thing that this does uh, call attention to is, uh, I guess the word that comes to mind for me is uh, integrity, um, or one could even just say a correlation between, uh, between um, professed beliefs and behavior. Uh, and, uh, you know, so you can be you can uh, you can be authentically a good person and authentically a really crappy person. <laughs> you know, in that, um, you know, you can authentically be a really you know not very pleasant person because what you say and what you do is, but you're authentic because it's it's just, there there's a correlation between those things. Um, so, but I you know I think when it comes to Matthew and our this this whole year in Matthew that's. That becomes it, that becomes really a litmus test uh, for, uh, and it really you know comes back to the beatitudes. And I you know and I think, I mean, I, I, when you hear uh, particularly the latter half of this passage, I know we were in Micah, but we were kind of going back and forth. But the latter half of this passage um, a, a, against the against the beatitudes. Uh, you know, place of honor and greeted with respect. People call them a certain name. There's just a strong contrast then between, you know, between observed or assumed power and meekness. Um, and, uh, and is that really what, what, what righteousness is? So I, I think you can do it. I think it's complex though, to engage people in those kinds of, of ways of thinking. Um, but, but I think, critical right now when we when we adjudicate not only you know our political leaders but our church leaders in terms of uh in terms of and and our and ourselves that's the that's the hard part i think that um you've lifted up the fact that we can't get away from integrity here we can't get away from authenticity in e any of these texts and um uh, the, the irony around humility is as soon as you recognize you have it, you've lost it. And that's the, um, the, the challenge that we have here as you lean out uh, for the, the question of what the guardrails are that you asked for, Matt. Um, I'm pulling now looking at the uh, Joshua text, which um, um, is constantly, the, the commentator constantly recognizes the character of being strong and courageous. And if the indictment is not for us to go political, which in this season, uh, in at least in North America, that's exactly where we want to go in the United States. But what does it mean to recognize the indictment on the church? What has the voice of the church spoken? Who has uh, the church been listening to, to, to ask Ralph's question? Um, who who uh, who is being harmed? Um, who is being lifted up? Who is being celebrated? And whether or not those of us who are authentic, let me say that again. I speak for a living. Those of us who are are authentic. <laughs> there's two a words. I can't put them together. Our authenticity is demonstrated if I shift to the uh, to the Joshua text by being strong. 
and courageous to be able to speak that truth and to recognize who is really to be exalted in the sight of the people of God. I love this Joshua story. We're going there. Um, it's just so fun. All of chapter three and four are kind of fun. If you have to read Joshua, you might as well read chapter three and four. <laughs> uh, because it's this, it's this crossing over story. I think I just love threshold stories in general. And I love memorial stories and they set up a memorial to this, but I, I'll grant you there is strength and courage here, but there's also the terrifying presence of God that causes the river to stop. Um, Elsewhere in the, it's not in the passage, but they're instructed to stay 2,000 cubits away from the ark, which is about a mile and a half. I'm sorry, a half mile, um, which is, it's just kind of funny to imagine like, how do you know if you're within that radius? <laughs> maybe you're, maybe you make sure your buddy walks in front of you or something like that. But just this kind of, this kind of awesome uh, respect for the power of the presence of God in the land making a way, making a safe way for you to cross in, but itself being this utterly terrifying thing. Um, there's something about that that, that, that that shows the ways in which strength and courage are always, or need to be um, tempered by, or at least paired with humility uh, and, a, and a healthy dose of the fear of the Lord and what that, what that looks like and to try to recreate this scene if that's what you wanna do. It's a scene, of course, that, that ties into conquest and that this is, you're only getting two passages out of Joshua, you have to address some really tough questions. But for this passage, at least, that idea of what does it mean to dwell in a place where the presence of God exists? Um, how, how can you do that in a way that's not humble? This would seem to be what, what Micah would remind you of. Or you get, you get, as Raiders of the Lost Ark, you get other people to open up the ark and see what happens. And then you just keep your eyes closed. <laughs> you keep your eyes closed. Don't Marianne. look, Marianne, don't look. <laughs> don't look. I have to look. No, don't look. So Indiana Jones knew what was going on. I'm just saying. He read his Bible. Yep, he did. So you knew, you knew the power. He knew this. Yeah. yeah. And, and that, there, there it is again. Do we? Do I mean, it, it brings us back to what Jesus is saying. You have a teacher. You have an instructor. It's an attention to say God is here. And so, Matt, you're absolutely right. The God that is among us is awesome, which sometimes is awful, which <laughs> makes it so awe-filling. And we forget that. We let God be just a buddy, just a... Um, uh, you know, a parenthesis. Uh, and maybe that's what we need is to ask ourselves, where is God among us that we are drawn not to uh, the celebrity status of our pastor, not to the uh, power uh, of our fortune or our fame, um, but to actually recognize that the one that we should be most attentive to, who can do the greatest harm and the greatest good is God among us. Psalm 43. Well, Carolyn, before we get there, I mean, yeah. this finally gives us a song. What? I, mean, I found it. Well, I mean, the Jordan River is, uh, is in half of the gospel bluegrass old time songs ever right jordan river oh. is chilly and wide or i got a home on the other side but uh, oh yeah you know, i so, went um, down to the river to pray that that, that's a different river but that's okay. it's a different river oh yeah. that's it. like lydia i think really? that's the american river isn't it? I went down to well the that's the interesting thing so james cone in his book the spirituals of blues says well why is it but the Jordan River is not chilly and wide, but the Ohio is. And that was the river to get across to get to freedom. Mm. And so in the, in the African-American spirituals, the, the, the river is not the river that divides. It, it's, it's much more like the river actually in Joshua. It's not, it, it's not the river between life and death. 
uh, mortality and eternity. It is the river to freedom. And so uh, it's interesting. Uh, someday I will uh, develop that into a paper or something because then you get to use all the music, right? Is uh, to talk about the reception of the Jordan River in uh, American music. But uh, I'll, anyway, I'll, so I just I'll, had to jump in there. I'll accompany your presentation of that you paper will. with a little violin or something. Fiddle. Little fiddle. That's right. It'll also be a, a reason to play banjo at Society of Biblical Literature. Uh, All right, I have a question, Rolf. Is yeah. Psalm 43 the shortest psalm? No, of course not, no. What is the shortest psalm? 117. 117. Yeah. How many verses is it? Either one or two. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, you know, it's just... This is pretty short, though. Praise the Lord, for he is faithful, and that's about it. That's, that's Psalm 117. <laughs> I think it's... Okay, now I got it. I can't just... I have to be precise. Right. I think it's two verses. It is two verses. For great two is his steadfast love huh. and his faithfulness endures forever. That would, be, that, that would be a great Bible trivia question. What is the shortest psalm? And what's the longest psalm? Because the longest. 119. Yes. 119. That's why I remember. That one I know. <laughs> All right. So what about this psalm? It could sound really bad with Joshua. Well, it doesn't. It can't sound with Joshua because the Psalms, the response to the first reading, I know, and so but it could 43. Sound really bad. I know. I, 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 so we don't have <laughs> enough money to do the both, both Old Testament lessons and both Psalms. So, the, so 43 goes with the Micah lesson. I know. Don't it does, complain. It, don't complain about not having money in the same breath as Micah three. We're going to get ourselves in trouble. I'm not complaining. I'm just trying to stop the email that somebody was already <laughs> composing to Caroline to teach no, 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 her. No, I I get that. I don't but like it's, Psalm sound 40. Really bad. I don't think it sounds good in connection to Micah 3 either in some ways. Mm -hmm. I don't want yeah. to put myself in Micah's shoes. I want to be the one Micah's speaking to. And well, I think vindicate me is my best response. <laughs> well, I agree. I, I think it's there because of verses, verse 3, send your light and your truth because, right? So in mm -hmm. Micah, he says, uh, you, you don't have a vision from God, so everything is darkness for you oh. so that uh, and jerusalem is going to be destroyed so then he says send your light and your truth let them lead me let them bring me to your holy hill so it's it's a oh. it's a response of penitence it's a response of penitence in verse three to the uh um oh. condemnation except for it's not because uh <laughs> verse one really is i haven't done anything wrong right Indicate me right but yeah, right that's the real problem but that's if you've ever been falsely accused of a very serious issue, I have in my life, uh, people close to me have uh, in court uh, situations and legal situations been accused of things that they were just not guilty of. The vindicate me is not, I'm, I'm completely sinless, but I didn't do this thing. And so that's, um, I'm really glad those psalms of protest are there uh, for people um, to have a, a verse for. Uh, I mean, for 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 that situation of being falsely uh, accused, but it really doesn't go well. Uh, I agree, Matt. <laughs> All right, and we're in our, we're in our uh, third week. Well, depending on what you um, what you. Uh, mark in your liturgical uh, tradition, but we are in our third week of uh, First Thessalonians, two. Here, it's important to know uh, Paul sometimes is has a bad reputation because people think he's full of himself because of passages like this. But it's important to know one aspect of the context that any philosopher, any teacher in first century world would be expected to that their conduct match their teaching. So for Paul to call attention to that isn't necessarily boasting as much as it's, this is what you would expect any teacher to say. You want to you want to know what my message is about? Look at how I lived my life when I was among you. That there's, it's not him saying I'm the best Christian in the world. It's just this is what everybody does. We see this in all sorts of other kinds of philosophical writings uh, of the day as well. And 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 Paul's trying to say, look, we were not peddling. We weren't. We weren't there to make money off of you, um, and you know that because we worked while we were there. It's so it's 
it's a defense of Paul, but it's also a defense of the gospel in the sense that this is not something that's meant to elevate me over you, my pupils. This is creating a new society in your midst. That is, that's just historical background. That's, that's, that's just the appetizer. There's got to be more we can say about this text. Oh, there, there, there is. I was just uh, uh, taking note of time, but you're exactly right. It's a repeat, too, of where we've been before in terms of the question of authenticity. Do we practice what we preach? Um, Jesus' response to um, the question of John's disciples was, tell them what you've seen done. And, and, and in this, you could almost say Paul is not just imitating the philosophers of the day, but he's also imitating Jesus. And that's the, the call for us as well. Are our works, are the things that we do, um, uh, lining up with our words? We've talked about that a lot over these last few weeks. I think this text just brings us right back to it. Well, and it's, you know, that's coming, I mean, it, it, if, you, if you just read this section, uh, it's it's a challenge to know where to go, but it's coming off of, you know, uh, obviously the verses before. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our, also our own selves because you have become uh, very dear to us. And so, it, it, you know, and then you have the image too uh, that Jesus or that Paul talks about. We were gentle among you like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children and here, uh, you have like a father with his children. And so it's, it's uh, you know, for the, for the Thessalonians, hearing from, you know, hearing from Paul uh, that, that this, is, this is all uh, the, the ways in which the, the proclamation of the gospel and that labor and toil is for the sake of um, them knowing fully the gospel and uh, and and from a place of of deep uh, and abiding love, and so it's a it's also a reminder that this uh, that the ways and you know the the language that Paul is using here is is reminding them that in part of that relationship that have they've had with Paul, and to what extent that that's something that they can going back to your comment, Matt, that's something that they can count on. It's not you know Paul saying, "Wow, look at me," but it's it's something to which they can look um, in their own struggle to uh, to imagine what this you know what does it look like to live out the gospel of God.